My t task here is to talk to you about CMR in the next 15 minutes. So <laughs> first off, uh, how many of you have CMR programs where you're at? Raise your hand. And how many of you do not? Okay, the ones that do not don't want to raise their hand. Or, Okay, so it looks like about half of the people have exposure to CMR where they're at. Cardiology, I think, has been very fortunate is that we have a rich history when it comes to imaging. Uh, obviously, echocardiography has been around since the late 60s and 1970s. Uh, nuclear cardiology, I think, really came around uh, in the 80s. And then CMR and CT, I think, are the newest techniques uh, that I really describe as, as ones that kind of reach their uh, mainstay in the 21st century. So let, let's start and just talk a little bit about, you know, what is CMR? So obviously, everyone's probably familiar with what an MRI scanner looks like. Uh, so it's this little donut-like machine. It looks similar to a CT scanner. Now, uh, the patient lays down on the bore of the scanner and then, or on a bed, and then the bed then goes into, inside the scanner bore. Now, the first thing you want to realize about CMR is from a safety standpoint, all right? Because if you don't understand CMR safety, you can have uh, major catastrophe. So remember, the magnet is always on, okay? <laughs> there's, there's no scenario. You don't turn the magnet on and off at the end of the day. So, so that, you know, that's, I mean, this is a, a, a problem that, you know, we, we, we sometimes uh, talk about in jest, but, but there's been cases of, of serious injury and death even when somebody accidentally takes an oxygen uh, tubing or, I mean, an oxygen, uh, uh, you know, uh, tube in. Uh, and because remember, because it's a very strong magnetic field, anything that's ferromagnetic becomes a projectile. And, and it actually accelerates as it gets closer and closer to the magnet. So there's been instances of people dying as a result. You know, obviously in this case, nobody died, but you know, it's not, you know, when you have this, you can't just simply pull the bed away or simply pull whatever piece of metal away. You have to t basically quench down the entire scanner, turn away the magnetic field, and then quench the scanner back up. And, and that's typically a cost of about fifty to $100,000. So, so um, clearly from a safety standpoint as well as from an economic standpoint, always remember you cannot go inside the MRI room if you have any metallic objects on you. Uh, and, and also remember, uh, if you take any objects that, uh, you know, that have magnetic stripes on them, credit cards, ID badges, if you take those inside the room, they're going to become deactivated. So you try to go shopping the weekend, you're not going to be able to buy anything. So, um, all right, so what's the basic principle? So obviously, really, it involves generating images using two principles. One is a magnetic field, and that's, again, provided by the scanner, and then radio waves, which, again, the scanner transmits and receives radio waves. Uh, and that's what really allows you to generate the image. And it, really, that's the basic uh, principle I want to talk about. I don't want to bore you guys with the, the uh, physics behind how CMR is, is uh, performed. Uh, I think it is important to recognize that there's actually a variety of indications that uh, are considered appropriate criteria for uh, uh, performing CMR. And uh, if anybody's interested, there's the appropriateness use criteria document, which you can reference um, you know, if you've got a couple hundred hours that you want to spend uh, going through these documents. But what I'm going to do is give you a high-level overview here of the, the versatility of CMR, the fact that it can do really a variety of different things. And I think that's one of the strengths uh, of CMR, which is we can use it to assess uh, uh, valvular heart disease for cardiac masses. We can use it to do perfusion testing and ischemia evaluation. Uh, we can use it for cardiomyopathies for uh, myocardial viability assessment, uh, pericardial disease, uh, anomalous coronary assessment, as well as for vascular disease. And I'll, and I'll go through and just kind of highlight some of these indications uh, briefly. So uh, first off, you know, I think that the, the basic foundation uh, with uh, any test in cardiology the basic thing we want to know is LV function, because there's obviously very strong prognostic information just by knowing what somebody's ejection fraction is. And so CMR, actually, many would say is considered the gold standard for assessment of uh, contractile function and ejection fraction. Uh, and one of the reasons for it is because you have very high quality images. You have a very sharp contrast between the blood pool and the myocardium. And when we actually calculate volumes and ejection fraction by CMR, there's no geometric assumptions that are being made. So you're actually basically planimetering the contour of the endocardium in each short axis slice. Now you'll notice there's a stack of short axis slices here, and these are all taken from the base of the heart to the apex of the heart every single centimeter. 
Um, so uh, by simply tracing each slice, summating the area times the thickness of the slice, you derive the volume of each slice, add that together, and from that you're able to derive the volume in end diastole. You do the same thing during end systole, and now you have end diastolic and end systolic volume that you can use to compute your stroke volume and your ejection fraction. And again, this is using the true Simpsons rule of disk with no geometric assumptions. And obviously there's a, a fair bit of data uh, showing, in fact, or, or validating the accuracy of the measurements that you that you uh, obtain by CMR. Now, not only for the LV, but it's also useful for the RV. Uh, and, and I think Dr. Little just uh, touched on earlier the fact that with echo, oftentimes you don't get a comprehensive view of the right ventricle, whereas with CMR, you can see in these images here, you can see the right ventricular myocardium just as well as you can see the left ventricular myocardium. And in fact, to compute RV uh, volumes and ejection fraction, you would use the same principle, but in this case, you would trace the contours of the right ventricle during diastole and systole, uh, and from that, uh, derive RV and systolic volumes and uh, end systolic volumes and RV ejection fraction. Um, now, what about for valve disease? So there's two methodologies that we utilize in CMR. One is just a direct assessment of anatomic orifice area. So uh, for those of you that have some exposure to TE, sometimes that's done in transesophageal echo, where you directly planimeter the uh, opening of the valve. And you can do that in CMR uh, as well. And one of the advantages with CMR is that if I want to look at aortic stenosis, for example, I'm not going to just pick one slice that I think is the, the tip of the leaflet. I'm actually going to obtain a series of slices that are all very contiguous with each other, uh, and then I can actually planimeter the smallest opening, and that allows me to, to derive what the anatomic orifice area is. And then uh, utilizing a principle called phase contrast CMR, which is similar, again, to echo Doppler, uh, we're actually able to measure flow across any given region of interest. And the advantage here is you're not limited by windows, you're not limited by uh, location. I can, you, you can essentially image flow in any blood vessel you want, whether it's the aorta, the pulmonary artery, uh, whether it's the SVC, IVC, wherever you want to image. Uh, and it's simply obtaining this velocity phase map, uh, drawing an ROI through each phase of the cardiac cycle, and then your scanner software will just summate the area underneath this curve and derive for you a, a forward stroke volume in this case. And, and you can also utilize this to uh, look at regurgitant lesions like uh, aortic or pulmonic regurgitation, where you will actually place an uh, 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 imaging volume above the aortic valve, and you actually then can derive what the forward flow is across this uh, imaging volume, as well as derive what the reverse flow is, and therefore determine what your aortic regurgitation severity is. Um, for uh, assessment of the AV valve regurgitation, so for the uh, mitral and tricuspid valves, we use a, a slightly different method, which is called an indirect method, where we measure the flow going out of the aorta, and we measure the volume of blood that's ejected by the ventricle uh, based on your uh, difference between your LV end diastolic and end systolic volume by planimetry of the left ventricle. And from that, you're actually able to derive what the mitral regurgitant volume is. And this is done using a method, what we call the indirect method. Um, and again, so you've got multiple different methodologies uh, that you can utilize for valve assessment, but certain methods are, are preferred uh, in, in certain valve uh, disease situations. Now let me turn next to uh, use of contrast-enhanced MRI. Uh, and, and really, the, the, the main utilization of this in cardiology is for assessment of myocardial viability and myocardial scar tissue. Um, and, and the unique advantage or, of CMR uh, is that you're able to get a very precise, high-resolution map of myocardial injured tissue. Uh, and basically, injury will uh, manifest itself as areas of bright or hyper-enhancement. So uh, what's unique is that this occurs both in the setting of an acute infarct, where you have uh, ruptured cell membranes, where you see hyperenhancement here in this LED infarction, uh, but it also occurs in the setting of a chronic myocardial infarction, where you actually now have uh, replacement uh, collagen fibrosis, uh, and, and again, you can see here's an example of somebody who has an uh, infarct in the right coronary artery distribution, and you'll notice because of the high-resolution maps that you're able to obtain, you can not only say there's an infarct present, we can actually go through and quantitate the severity of the infarct or the transmural extent of the infarct. And in this patient, in uh, example one here, you can see there's a transmural infarct in the, in the anterior wall. In the second patient here, it's a subendocardial infarct involving about 50% of the wall thickness. And in the third patient, 
it's a subendocardial infarction involving only about 25% of the wall thickness. So we go beyond uh, simply presence or absence of infarction, but actually quantitate the transmural extent of infarction. And this data is important uh, because it actually can help you to predict the likelihood of, of functional improvement. Uh, and, and this actually seems to hold true both in the setting of chronic CAD, in the setting of acute coronary disease, as well as, in fact, in the setting of chronic heart failure, where you're uh, treating a patient with medical therapy, where as the extent of infarction in any given segment goes up, so once you get more than 75% of a segment that shows infarction, the likelihood of improvement or recovery of function is very, very little. Uh, but on the other hand, if you have no uh, hyper enhancement or no infarction in a segment, you have a much higher likelihood of improvement, and there's inverse relationship which holds true in any uh, setting, acute, chronic, CAD, uh, as well as chronic heart failure, uh, simply getting treated with medical therapy. We can also utilize uh, the information with CMR to help us identify further cardiomyopathies. And so obviously just by looking at morphologic criteria, uh, it can help you to identify somebody who has a restrictive uh, cardiomyopathic picture versus somebody who has more of a dilated cardiomyopathic picture. Uh, it can help you identify somebody who has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where there's significant thickening of the septum, uh, or to identify uh, marked trabeculations here in this person who has uh, non-compaction cardiomyopathy. And then when you couple the morphologic imaging with the contrast-enhanced CMR in cardiomyopathies, I think you get a very robust tool. Uh, and here's an example of a person who has uh, both mild left ventricular and right ventricular wall thickness, mild biventricular dysfunction. But the key finding here is when we give contrast and you do delayed enhancement MRI, what you'll notice here is that there's diffuse hyperenhancement really everywhere. And this is a very characteristic finding that you see uh, in patients of infiltrative cardiomyopathy such as amyloid. Uh, here's an example of somebody who has uh, right ventricular uh, dysplasia. And again, you can see uh, dysfunction here uh, of the uh, uh, lateral wall of the right ventricle. In addition to that, there's uh, a depressed right ventricular ejection fraction and a dilated right ventricle. Um, so in fact, this, this cartoon kind of points out that the differing patterns of hyperenhancement that you'll see in patients who have differing forms of cardiomyopathy. Uh, so obviously in ischemic cardiomyopathy, what you would expect to see is uh, hyperenhancement that's tr either transmural or that's subendocardial based. Because remember, ischemic injury progresses in the wavefront phenomenon from the subendocardium outward. Whereas in non-ischemic injury, you see differing patterns where it can be the middle of the myocardium, which oftentimes occurs with myocarditis or idiopathic cardiomyopathy, uh, epicardial, which you can frequently see with sarcoid, myocarditis, Anderson Fabry disease, or Chagas, or in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where you tend to see uh, hyperenhancement at the RV insertion sites, uh, both at the anterior and inferior RV insertion sites of the septum. So again, utilizing the pattern of uh, enhancement to try to help you to further identify what the potential underlying etiology of the cardiomyopathy is. Now, this is a busy slide here, just kind of showing different characteristics of different cardiac tumors. And I'm not going to go through all the details here, but CMR can be useful, again, in trying to uh, help you to characterize benign versus uh, malignant cardiac tumor. Uh, obviously, CMR can also be used for assessment of aortic disease. Uh, you can see both with CINE imaging, which allows you to actually do dynamic imaging of the aorta, as well as angiographic imaging, which creates a luminogram of the aorta. And we can also use this for peripheral arterial disease, where you can do a, a complete runoff uh, from abdomen all the way down to feet. And so again, um, you know, if you, uh, you know, I think it's worthwhile to at least look at the table, uh, which, which all of you should be able to get access to from the slides, which kind of goes through and highlights some of the appropriate indications for CMR, uh, which I touched on uh, over the last 15 minutes or so. Uh, and then the last issue I think I'll leave you with, you know, is that it's always important, you know, uh, you know notice my talk is sandwiched between a talk on uh, nuclear cardiology and cardiac CT, so I can't get away without talking about the importance of radiation exposure. And, and these numbers may change. You know, I think all the techniques are, are working to reduce the radiation exposure. But remember, diagnostic angiogram has radiation. PCI has some radiation. Cardiac CT and nuclear cardiology has some radiation exposure. These numbers are getting lower, but one of the advantages is that CMR has no radiation exposure. Thank you. And uh, uh, next, uh, Dr. Mamarian is going to uh, chew me out here.